Simon and Schuster Audio presents Vert by Jeff Noon. Read by Paul McGann. A young boy puts a feather into his mouth. Day one. Mandy came out of the all-night vert you want, clutching a bag of goodies. Close by was a genuine dog, flesh and blood mix, the kind you don't see much anymore. A real collector's item. It was tethered to the post of a street sign. The sign read, No Go. Slumped under the sign was a robo crusty. He had a thick head full of droid locks and a dirty handwritten card. Hungry and homeless, please help. Mandy, all twitching steps and head jerks, scurried past him. The crusty raised his sad little message ever so slightly, and the thin pet dog whined. Through the van's window I saw Mandy mouth something at them. Fuck off, crusties, get a life. Something like that. I was watching all this in the halo of night lights. We stuck to the dark hours in those days. The thing was on board, and that was a major crime. Possession of live drugs, a five-year stretch guaranteed. We were waiting in the van for the new girl. Beetle was up front. Ladies' leather gloves pulled tight onto his fingers, smeared with vase. He likes to feel a little bit greased when he rides. I was in the back, perched on the left side, wheelhousing, Bridget on the other, sleeping. Some thin wisps of smoke were rising from her skin. The thing from outer space lay between us. He was leaking oil and wax all over the place, lying in a pool of his own juices. I caught a movement in the air above the parking space. Oh, shit. Shadow cop. Broadcasting from the store wall. Working his mechanisms, flickering lights in smoke. And then the flash of orange and info beam shining out from the shadow cop's eyes. It caught Mandy in its flare path, gathering knowledge. She ducked down from the beam, banging hardcore on the van doors. The dog was howling at the cop, scared by the lights. I opened the doors, a thin girl measure, Mandy slipped through. The dog went for the cop's legs, twin fangs closing on nothing but mist. That dog was confused. Mandy handed me the bag. You got it? I got some beauties. You got the one. Manny just looked at me. Something was howling outside. I glanced back and I saw the poor dog on fire. The shadow cop moving towards us, reloading. He let loose a tight info, beaming onto our number plate, which was just a series of random numbers anyway. You won't find that in your banks. Then we were out of there, reversing first away from the bollards. What's it? This from Mandy, nervous as fuck as the van jerked backwards. She was thrown to the floor, landing on the thing from outer space. Brid was rudely pitched from sleep, pupils in shock from the sudden awakening. The thing had six tentacles wrapped round Mandy. The girl was screaming, calling it names. The van leapt up onto a pavement. I thought the beetle was trying to dodge the beams. Maybe he was, but all we felt was a sickening thud and a yowling scream as the left back wheel put the collector's item out of its misery. The crusty was crying over his dog and pushing his fists through the shadow cop smoke as we scorched the forecourt. The van made a wild circle and I saw the whole thing sliding by. The shadow cop, the crusty, the dead dog, until Beetle got it under control. I could see the shadow cop beaming messages into the air. They're on to us, B. It the jam. Beetle took the brow of the gateway at speed. Oh boy, were we flying. Stash riders. Riding the feathers back to the pad. The point of impact squelched Mandy deeper into the thing's embrace. Get the fuck off me! Keeping firm hold of the strap, I reached down with the free hand, jabbing at the thing's belly flesh, tickling him. The one weak spot. How oh, he loved that. His laughter was dredged up from deep inside, from thousands of miles. He was writhing around and Mandy was able to slide free. Fuck that! Jesus! She was shaking from the fight. Alexandra Park was a dark jungle shimmering the right side windows. We were skirting Bottle Town by now, and no doubt the park was full of demons, pimps, pros, dealers, real, vert, or robo. I looked back. Cop cars closing, Beetle. Hang on, folks! He twisted the van into a tight right, onto Claremont Road. I could see the cop lights following. They're still with us. 
Beetle burned all the way down over the Princess Road into the Rush Home Maze. Cops were following, but they were up against three killer factors. Beetle had lover's knowledge of these streets. All moving engine parts were greased with Vaz. Beetle was hooked on speed. We hung on tight as he took a vicious series of lefts and rights. It was a tough job hanging on, but we didn't mind. Old-style terraces passed by each side of us. On one of the walls, someone had scrawled the words, Das Uber Dog. And underneath that, Pure is poor. Even I didn't know where we were. That's the beetle for you. Total knowledge, fuelled by jam and vaz. A quick glance through the back windows. There go the cops, speeding on by, towards some dumb fuck nowhere. Bye-bye, suckers. I called out to the beetle. Oh, slow down, some bee. Fuck slowness. Then the new girl. Well, I like eggs back here, you beetle. And the guy slowed us down some. Well, there you go. Some things will slow the beetle down. The chance of a new woman, for instance. Bridget must have had the same feeling. She was looking daggers at the new girl. Smoke rising from her skin as she tried her best to tune into the beetle's head. I guess she wasn't getting too far. No matter. We were in some kind of easy travelling by now, so I picked up the goodie bag, emptying the contents out onto the tartan rug. Five blue vert feathers floated down. I caught one as it drifted, reading the printed label. Thermo fish. Done it. Mandy said, Next time, Scribble, you go shopping. Where's English voodoo? You promised me. I thought you had contacts. That's what Seb had. I read the other four. Done it. Done it. Done it. Not done it, but it sounds boring anyway. I let the feathers go in disgust. Now they were floating around inside the van. A blue feather landed on the stomach of the thing from outer space. One of his tentacles reached for it. His spiky fingers took a hold, and a hole opened up in his flesh, a greasy orifice. He turned the feather in his feelers and then stroked it in, direct to the hole. He started to change. I wasn't sure which feather he loaded, but from the way he was moving his feelers, I guess he was swimming with the thermo fish. I sure know that wave. I turned back to Mandy. Give. You want? I want. You found the voodoo? We turned right into the Wimslow Road as Mandy pulled a stash from the inner reaches of her denim jacket. It was a black feather. Totally illegal. No voodoo, but I found this. Seb called it skull shit. Said it was red hot. Is this all you got, Mandy? You don't like? Sure, I like. It's just not what I want. Some egg do. I was losing it. Mandy, I don't think you realise. Her red hair was catching fire from each passing street lamp. I had to pull myself away from the flames. That new girl was getting to me. Hey, you two, keep it quiet, Bridget said. The shadow girl. Some of us are trying to get some sleep. Bridget was Beetle's lover. And I guess she was just putting the new girl in her place. The van took a sudden swerve and we were all thrown to the wall. The black feather slipped from Mandy's grip... The thing made a swipe for it, but he was so wave deep pressed against the van side, his feelers were numb and he missed out. I scooped the outlaw flight up into my palms. The van took another swing, no doubt dodging some dumb fuck pedheads. The beetle was shouting through his window, Fucking walkers, get a car! We were riding through Rushholm, straight down the curry chute. Mandy Ann cranked the window. She managed a half-inch gap before the mechanism failed, clogged up with rust. But through the tiny gap, a rich complex of powder smells was making my tongue wet. Coriander, cumin, cinnamon, cardamom, each of them genetically fine-tuned to perfection. Christ, Mandy told the gang. I could kill for a curry. When did we last eat? The beetle answered, Thursday. Bridget spoke from the half-lit world of shadow. What day is it now? It's the weekend sometime, I said. As I spoke, I watched the thing. By now he was a blur of feelers and I could almost see the thermo fish swimming in his veins. It was making me envious. So can anyone tell me why we're carrying this alien shit around? Asked Mandy. Why don't we just sell him? Or eat him? I mean, why, why are we chasing around after feathers? We got the thing right here. We don't need feathers. The thing comes with us, I told her. Nobody touches him. You just want to make the swap. You got a problem with that, Mandy? Let's just get home, let's take some stuff. 
we will do. I felt for her all of a sudden. She was new to us, two days old in a gang and full of the will to please. It's just that she had a hard act to follow. We took a hard right into Platte Lane and then another into the garage space behind the flat. The van scalded to a sudden stop. Only the thing was coping. His body full of wave knowledge, vert knowledge. He just sort of flowed into the doors and then away, loving it. And then the voice. Scribble. 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 There's the moaner's voice. I looked round to see he was playing the fool. Oh, shit. Nobody should use that voice. And I got a sudden flash then of Desdemona falling away from me, through into a yellow blaze. Who said that? Said what, Scribble? Mandy asked. My name, who the fuck said it? A silence fell over the van. Oh, it was in... It was in Desdemona's voice. Mandy again. Oh, do we have to keep thinking about her? Yes. Yes, we do. Keep thinking about Desdemona. Don't ever let her go. Not until I find her again, and then keep her forever. I listened to the van settling its rust deposits. The riders were looking at me. Even the beetle was twisted round, his eyes full of jam. Nobody said anything, Scrib. But then I got it again, that voice. Scribble. Scribble. And I got where it was coming from. A thing. A gash had opened in his flesh. A set of black gums peeled back from crumbling teeth and a tongue of lard moving in there between them. Scribble. But only I could hear. Why was it only me? And why was he using that voice, that beautiful voice? Beetle broke the mood. Let's do it. Inside. I heard an owl calling from the Platte fields. Real, vert or robo, who can tell the difference anymore? No matter. It had a longing to it. This week's safe selection, my kitlings. You know the game cut doesn't lie. Status? blue and legal. Thermo fish. You went swimming in the seas at pitch, but now you're back on earth and you're feeling slightly queasy. It can only get worse, because the thermo fish of pitch have invaded your system. Your bloodstream is a river home for them. They love those passages. You're feeling the heat inside, the biting heat. One thing to do, Buy yourself some nano books, some pitchworm bait. Go fishing for a week. We had to drag the thing from outer space out of the van. His fat sack of a body clinging to the tartan rug, glued by the juices. Beetle open the van doors. Come on, lazy fucks. He reached into the back to gather the drop feathers from the van floor, and one of them. The black, he slipped into his backy box. I feel like tripping out somewhere. He was walking fast towards the house. The door cam reacted to Beetle's image in a loving way, opening its gates in a slow, seductive swing. Brid was back in shadow mode, sleepwalking to the stepplight, so that left me and Mandy holding the can. The can was the thing, and he was like vaz between our fingers. Oh boy, thing was hot. Totally adventurous. Respect to that. Let's move it, big thing. The Desdemona calls had stopped. Now he was rambling in his own language. Za, za, za. Ja, ji, ja, ji. Stuff like that. Maybe he was travelling the vert waves looking for a new home. Maybe I'm some kind of romantic fool. Especially when the Manchester rain starts to fall in memory. And I'm scribbling this down. Chasing the moments. Miles from there. And years and years later, I can still feel that slow struggle towards the flat door. Thing from outer space wasn't really from outer space. Mandy just called him that, and we'd all latched onto it. Well, then what would you call a shapeless blob that didn't speak any known language and had come into your world by a bad accident? 
tough one, eh? Stop dropping him, hissed Mandy. Does it look like I'm dropping him? His head's on the floor. I was at his head, I thought it was his tail. Mandy was getting angry at me, as though I should enjoy carrying aliens over wet gravel, in the dark, in the rain, as though I should know all the various techniques of carrying aliens. Just then a shadow cop flickered into life, broadcasting from the Platfields aerial. He moved like a fog, the starry lights of his mechanisms going on and off, on and off, as he drifted through the trees. I told Manny to get a move on. Look who's talking about speed. We had to bend the thing into a strange shape to get him in through the house doors, a kind of Mobius not variant. The thing didn't mind, his body was super fluid anyway from the embrace of Vert. A quick glance over the shoulder told me that the shadow cop was out of the park and heading towards the flats. I slammed the door on the site. Silence. Pause. A catch of breath. The look of despair in Mandy's eyes. Naked eyes under the lights. Her arms straining to hold the weight of alien meat. Above us, on the next landing, Brid was drifting with the shadows. Trailing smoke. Follow her, Mandy. It was like carrying a bad dream up a flight of greasy, collapsing stairs. Sometimes it feels like the whole world is smeared with vaz. Mandy spoke between panting breaths. Seb told me something. There's a new delivery tomorrow. Of what? New stuff. Good stuff, he said. Bootlegs, well black. Voodoo's not black, I told you that. Yeah, English voodoo. Seb, he's got it. Mandy! Not yet, coming in tomorrow. Mandy, this is... Watch out, the thing, he's... I was dropping the alien. My hands were too sweaty. I was losing the world. A feather was floating in my mind, a beautiful, multicoloured specimen. I almost had it. Just reach out. Scribble, what's wrong with you? I need it, Mandy. No messing. We've got to find Seb again. Not him. He, he gave me the contact name. He said that Icarus was getting a new delivery. Icarus? Icarus Wing, that's his source. Seb's supplier. Find him, Mandy. Ask him about English voodoo. Scrip? Mandy's eyes in shock mode. What? What is it? Over there. The corner. We'd reached the first landing by now. There was a store cupboard set into a wall. It was marked, no go. In the dark space between it and the wall lay a coil of rope, a violet and green rope. It moved, sudden-like. Mandy screamed, it's a snake. What the fuck? Just then the lights went out. Bastard landlord had him on a strict timer and the next switch was some two feet away. Down the landing, two feet's a long way to go when you're carrying an alien and it's dark and there's a dream snake on the loose. Don't panic, Mandy. Turn on the fucking light! Don't move. Mandy dropped the thing. I still had my hands on the one end and I felt the weight jerk as the bulk hit the floor. Mandy was running to the next switch. Snakes can see in the dark, but we can't. So hit that switch, new girl. I was sweating with the fear and the thing was starting to slip from my fingers. The lights came back on, but it wasn't Mandy who'd hit the switch. The woman from 210 had come out to see the noise and she'd got to the switch first. This is what she saw. Mandy, frozen, two inches from the control, me holding on for dear life to a pulsating mass of feelers and grease, a whip-fast coil of violet and green slither into the nearest shadow. I felt a nagging pain in my left leg just where I'd been bitten. But that was over four years ago. So why the pain? Memory can be a right bitch sometimes. The woman just stared at us for long seconds before she spoke. What is it? Mandy looked at me. I looked at Mandy, and then at the thing in me weakening hands, and then at the woman. It's a prop, I said. Woman looked at me. We're part of a, an avant-garde theatre company. We're called Drip Feed Theatre. We're doing a new piece entitled English Voodoo. We've had this um, uh, this thing made for us by a mad artist. He made it out of old tyres and a ton of animal fat. We're just taking delivery. Oh, my God. How gross. The woman slipped back inside her flat and slammed the door. Mandy and I smiled. We smiled. 
and something passed between us. Don't ask what. Mandy looked about. Has the snake gone? Dream snakes come out of a bad feather called Takshaka. Anytime something small and worthless was lost to the vert, one of these snakes crept through in exchange. Those snakes were taking over, I swear, you couldn't move from. It's gone. Hit the switch one more time, let's finish this. So we climbed the stairs together. Two humans, one alien strung heavy between them. We hauled the thing up and more or less manhandled that meat towards flight 315. I smashed into the door, expecting a hard response, but the way was open. Well open as we fell through, all three of us, male, female, alien. Mandy kicked the door shut with a neat back heel, and we collapsed into one shivering heap on the hall carpet. This week's Black Selection. Skull shit is one heavy fuck. Don't try it alone, kitlings. This vert is going to blast you. You'll be travelling the paths of your own mind. And that's some maze in there. There's a beast at the centre, and it's angry. Only the Chosen know what the beast looks like, because only the Chosen get that far. Note... Possession of this beauty can land you a two-year stretch. That's a load of game time to be missing, so stay cool. Keep it close. This cat has warned you. Brid was slumped on the city, slow gazing at a two-week-old copy of the game cat. Beetle was standing by the window. Leafing through the feather stash. I had the right side of me face laid out on the dining table. Me left eye fixed on a small lump of apple jam. The thing from outer space was lying on the floor, waving for a fix, his grease dripping onto Bridget's Turkish rug. Mandy was in the kitchen, eating bread and honey. Yeah, sure. And the king was in his counting house, counting out his money, no doubt. Except that we just trashed a week's trip feed on five lousy blues and a single done it already black. Sure, the beetle could sell some low level vert to a robo crusty. Or maybe I could persuade Brit to sing some smoky songs in one of the locals, me on keyboards and decks. But the shadow cops were everywhere. Most pubs had one, broadcasting from above the vert box, shining info all over the undesirables. Those info beams could match your face up to the cop banks in half a nanosec. Dear sir, we have reason to believe that you are currently receiving basic needs allowance. Who the fuck doesn't take drip feed these days? We hope you are not receiving payment for tonight's performance. This would be in direct violation of decree 729. Please disclose. Of course, officer. Straight away. I think not. That apple jam sure looked tasty. Boy, we were hungry. Mandy came back out of the kitchen clutching a doorstopper sandwich. She plumped herself down on a scatter cushion. We were all there, all five of us, the stash riders, in some form of life or another. The beetle turned to face us, the five blue feathers clutched in one hand. He took each blue into his other hand, saying their names out loud, each in turn, and then let them fall to the carpet. Thermo fish. Crack flowers. Venus dust. Thunder wings. Honey suckers. We watched the feathers drift. Beetle turned directly to Mandy. Cheap blues? We don't do cheap blues. The beetle opened his backy box, took out the black feather. He moved towards us, waving that vert like a dream ticket. So, for tonight's entertainment, skull shit. His lips were smiling. It was a wicked smile. Mandy opened her mouth immediately like she had something to prove. The beetle pushed the feather into her mouth until he could stroke it against the back of her throat. New girl took it all the way like a porno vert star, and her eyes started to glaze. The beetle smiled. See how she takes it? Smooth and easy. That's my baby. Beetle pulled the feather out, and then he turned to Bridget. Brid was lying on the couch, face covered by a copy of Game Cat. 
Can I miss this one? I'm not up to it, B. Nobody misses nothing. Beetle scrunched the paper from Bridget's face and then forced the feather into her mouth. Shit. That was face rape. But I was too weak to do anything. Next he turned to the thing, feeding the feather into the nearest orifice. The thing was rolling all over the carpet. I swear I could almost hear him cheering. Then the beetle turned to me, his voice calling to me over the years. Scribble. Oh, it was some voodoo coming in tomorrow. Mandy told me, let's wait. Fuck waiting. Take it. He forced me mouth wide open, the fingers of one hand squeezing me cheeks, the other hand pushing the feather home, deep to the back of the throat. I could feel it there, tickling, making me want to gag. And then the ver kicked in, and then I was gone. I felt the opening adverts roll, and then the credits. The pad went morphic, and my last thoughts were, why are we all doing this? Skull shit. It's so low level, it's, it's even got adverts in it. We should be going higher, searching for lost love. Instead we were just playing, just playing. Screaming down tunnels of brain flesh, putting thoughts together, building words and cries, cries from the heart. Electric impulses leading me on the room, wallpapered in reds and pinks, blood all flowing down from the ceiling, Brid hiding behind the settee, the beetle taking Mandy from behind on the Turkish rug, a thing from outer space floating in the air, gently landing on the dining table, me walking through a swamp of flesh towards the kitchen door in search of breakfast cereal, stepping over beetle and Mandy, finding the kitchen door locked and barred, looking just like a wall of beef, blood pulsing from the keyhole, Brid coming out from behind the settee, clutching a bread knife. The thing finding a lump of jam on the tabletop, licking at it. I wanted that jam for myself. Jam turning to spunk. Apple spunk. Thing licking at it. Me turning to the lovemakers. Brid taking slices out of Thing's backside, trying to feed them to me. Me turning me face away from the pink flesh. Didn't know why flower clock reading 20 petals to 11 beetle shooting apple cum it splattered over me poster of interactive madonna at woodstock 7 mandy coming with him brid turned the blade into beetle's neck blood flowing from beetle's neck me licking up the blood it tasted just like apple jam tasted like vert just like a dream tasted like a dream that means oh shit sudden scream shit I was getting haunted. That means... That means... We're in the vert. Beetle, listen to me. We're in the vert. I'm getting the haunting. The haunting was the feeling you got sometimes in the vert. The real world calling you home. Like, this is all too much. There's another life somewhere. This is just a game. The beetle kept on tasting the jam. Rolling it on his tongue, he reached out to stroke Mandy's arm as she plunged the knife into her veins. The blood was spraying over interactive Madonna, mixing with the spunk already plastered there. I guess that dead star was really interacting now. And then Mandy had Desdemona's face. And it was Desdemona doing the screaming. The blood pouring out of her beautiful mouth. It was too much for me. I had to get out of there. Sudden jerk. Backwards. Ghost grabbing me under the armpits, jerking me into reality, and then the real world breaking open. The chair receiving me body like a corpse. Blood seeping back into the closing wounds on the wall. The room in a scream of pain. A glass vase containing flowers picked by Brid. It shatters, broken by the jerk. A voice calling from the mirror on the wall. Who the fuck? Beetle's voice. Who the fuck? Who the fuck jerked out? No answers. Beetle was wide screening as all his eyes still covered with layers of flesh, of game flesh. He had a raging full on and he was waving it like a flag. Who the fuck? Any answers? Nothing. Brid on the settee. Game cat torn into shreds. Mandy on the floor, 
beside the scatter cushion. Two vicious gashes had torn it apart. Feathers floated, beetle raging. I was having a good time in there. I was trapped in the chair. Through a haze of feathers and flesh, the desperate shapes of vert still clinging onto life, I could just about make out the thing from outer space. He was screaming and shaking. Man, he was suffering. And I could see the holes in his flesh where the knife had cut. The thing was always badly affected by vert, but the wounds were healing over, regenerating. This was the thing's special skill. Total flesh replacement. But still he was suffering. Everything goes wrong. Eventually. Everything goes wrong. I still couldn't move. Just listening to his keen and the thing just wanted to be home and peaceful. What the fuck were you going to do with him? Who the fuck pulled out? Not me, B. I managed. Lying. Scared. I was having a good fucking time. Nobody takes me out like that. Nobody. Silence, then. Each of us looking at him. The last glaze of vert falling from him, from all of us, and the room was suddenly cold. Cold and lonely and full of aftershock. Pulling out was bad. Real bad. It was a built-in option with low-level theatres, but nobody liked doing it. It was like admitting defeat, like you weren't strong, not up to it. Who dared admit that? Even worse, you pulled all the other players with you. And that was painful. That was like being skinned. Then Bridget's lonely voice. It was me. I was scared, B. Beetle hit Brid right across the lips. She was crying in the corner now, and if I could have just got out of that chair, well then, maybe I would have done some good deed for a change. Maybe I would have killed a bastard. Maybe everything end up with nothing. Beetle left us then, slamming his bedroom door behind him. Me, the shadow, the new girl, the alien, and everything going wrong, and the far-off call of the owl. If they can remix Madonna after she's dead, why can't they remix the night? Who can answer that one? Awake, you know that dreams exist. Inside a dream, you think the dream is reality. Inside a dream, you have no knowledge of the waking world. It is the same with Vert. In the real world, we know that Vert exists. Inside the Vert, we think that Vert is reality. You have no knowledge of the real world. The Haunting. This is the bitch incarnate. Once that ghost has got hold of you, you just got to go with her back to life, back to the boredom. That's how you feel, right? Except that the haunting isn't a bad thing. What? What's that the cat's saying? Haunting isn't bad. Man, the cat's losing it. Listen up, kidlings. Only a chosen few get the haunting. They are the edge riders. Those strange people who can't make their minds up. Just what am I? This is their question. But or real. The haunted are of both worlds. They flicker between the two like fireflies. What are they? Insect or flame? Both. Believe it. The haunted are special. They just don't know it yet. The cat's advice to them? Resist the temptation. Don't jerk out. Jerking out is giving in, giving up, giving up on your true vocation. The haunting is calling you, come up, come up. Let me take you higher. The vert wants you. The cat wants 